Okay. So I guess uh, our presenters, who's presenting today? Us two, and then two more people. Uh, the two of you, and uh, Eric, is, are yeah. you presenting? Yeah. And who else? Stephanie? No. Uh, Min Hong. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks for all of you for attending yesterday night's steps. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the experience. I know it was pretty long. Uh, being there for the whole time, but I think it's a good way to culminate uh, your experience of taking the class and uh, the study session. Um, like I said, uh, over the last couple of weeks, there will be a, a new reinforcement, uh, the UCB lectures that I will try to also facilitate, uh, as I did for this session next semester. So um, if you're a first year student, uh, even though you've fulfilled your lab rotation requirements, um, I, I would have really much appreciate if you'd like to join that class and work with us again. Uh, we do have students, uh, you know, you've seen a couple of them already, who are both undergrads, even pre-university pre students who participate in this class. And if you're from industry, again, we welcome you uh, to participate. Okay, uh, unfortunately, I cannot offer it late nights, uh, well, it's not even late nights, uh, uh, evening hours, because uh, my family needs to see me once in a while. Uh, so I decided that next semester I will be home for them during a practical dive for dinner every night, because we value our family time, too. So um, they've excused me for this semester, and so that's why we had the benefit of having more industry participants. But even those of us who are in the industry, if you can find a time to have your organization support, having a block of time where you're participating in Google Hangouts, that's, that's a good way of doing it. Okay, so without further ado, uh, we'll have uh, our presenters today. Thank you. Okay, good evening, guys. Hope you all are doing good. Today, we will be presenting, me and my friends who are here will be presenting on semi-supervised learning for NLP. So it's one of the last few lectures in the Stanford course. The agenda for our presentation today will be as follows. We will be first covering on why we need to use semi-supervised learning, why is its usefulness, and after that we will just cover three semi-supervised learning algorithms, namely pre-training, self-training, and consistency regularization. Well, before we go into all this uh, semi-supervised learning or that, let's just uh, consider the bigger picture. So, can anyone answer this question? Why has deep learning been so successful? I mean, we already have machine learning or that, right? So, why do we need deep learning? Yeah, just anything. I mean, I would say it's because of um, cheap computation. Cheap computation, exactly. That's one of them. Anything else? Why do we want deep learning over like standard methods of analyzing data or like drawing insights? Huge data. Huge data, correct. So the reason why deep learning has been so successful recently is it's because compared to other approaches, as your data size increases, as processing speed, processing power of your computers increase, having a neural network based approach always yields better results. Because now I have many, many data, all of them are labeled I might as well just use neural networks with many layers and like accurately predict my data instead of having to do other approaches. So uh, some of the things, as you said, uh, you have more optimization tricks that you can get, get with. You have better hardware. As hardware size increases, you want to be able to use all your processing power effectively. And of course, as you said, larger data sets. So bigger data sets means you can yield better results with deep learning. These are some of the, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of this, uh, Google Translate, image recognition, AI that plays games for you. Hmm. So back to the context of NLP itself, uh, we have, these are some of the NLP data sets, just to get a representation. So NLP by nature itself has huge, huge data sets, dictionaries, languages, and there are many users for NLP. So one of the main drawbacks I would say is that sometimes when you have very big data, not all of them will be labeled, right? And sometimes when you have a lot of unlabeled and labeled data, uh, you cannot really um, 
okay, you, you cannot really spend a lot of time or money to label the data points. Because let's say if I take into account something like this, there are a lot of other languages used by other native speakers and sometimes for these languages specifically, you don't really know what the languages mean or the data isn't really annotated or labeled. So you cannot always use a generic deep learning based approach that we have always been using. Or you can, but you have to go back and label all the data points. So just to draw on some uh, examples, let's say I have a large data set. I have some of it which is labeled already, and many of it which is unlabeled. So what can we do using the unlabeled data? Is it a good idea to just uh, label the data points and use that for your training? Would you all go with that approach? Or would you all just use the labeled data points to do your analysis? Correct. So how would you do that? You train with the labeled data and? Then we uh, train with the labeled data that we can get the model. And uh -huh. this model we train with our labeled data. Correct. So this is one of the techniques that is we are going to cover today known as, uh, that's actually, um, I believe that's self-training. Yes, that's self-training. Is there, uh, hmm. Hmm. Yes? Correct. So what you do is you label the data first, right? And then you use your now existing model to train the to predict the y values for the unlabeled data, right? Yes. But and then now, after that, you feed it back in, yeah. train it again, and then go backwards, and then do repeat this process, right? Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. Correct. It is like that. So self training is one of the adopt one of the ways. Like this is called self semi supervised learning. You have labeled data, you have unlabeled data, but you want to use this unlabeled data as effectively as possible to build a much better model. So the techniques you discussed was called self training, which we'll cover later on. Hmm. Um, any other suggestions if I've unlabeled or labeled it all? Anyone has any other ways to optimize? I think I've worked in this area, so I'm sure you would have something to share. How else can you use unlabeled data? Faster. Faster. Yes. You can always represent probably an unknown data point as a linear combination of known data points. Interesting. There is another approach we'll discuss which has to do with uh, doing something with the unlabeled data first before you train it with the labeled data. Is that what you're referring to? Um, hmm. Maybe. You can, you can build an encoder or, or something that projects Yeah, the correct, space exactly. Using yeah. labeled data and that's an initial step. Correct. This is another one of the approaches you'll cover later on. Yeah. So to draw more insights into what exactly is this uh, idea of semi-supervised learning, uh, the Stanford slides use this data set called the two moons data set. So suppose I have uh, a bunch of data points scattered around and we have already labeled them accordingly. However, let's say that, oh, now some of the examples don't have labels anymore. So you only know those and then those three below. So if I just use a, a normal supervised learning approach and I just try to uh, train on this data set, I'll get something like this. Which seems okay now, but then when I put back in the unlabeled data, I realize that, oh, actually it's not very good. <clears throat> so as we have discussed earlier, we'll cover three main approaches to solving this problem. And the idea is that uh, pre-training is 
uh, the, the idea behind pre-training is to use your unlabeled data first, you train it, you get some weights, and then you feed those weights into a supervised learning model. The idea behind self-training is, self-training is rather more intuitive. I train with the labeled data first, so I have a working model. Then I use that working model to predict data for my unlabeled data set. And the predictions I get may not be very accurate. So what I do is I get some of the more accurate ones I think I know, feed it back into my data set, and train again and keep repeating this process. So this iterative approach will allow me to converge towards a much better model. And consistency regularization, I'm not too sure, but I believe it's one of the ways to improve upon self-training. But my friends will cover that later on. So I think that's my part. And I'll hand over now to Julius to cover what exactly is free training. OK, so yeah. So like Marco mentioned, free training is a bit like uh, free processing of data. So you take the unsupervised data, and you generate, uh, out of that, you initialize some weights that you can be used for your uh, supervised mm -hmm. model, essentially. So for example, uh, as we all know, so like from week one, we learned so with the, this technique called word to vec. So word to vec, as you know, is you take some words and you uh, use a unsupervised model to generate word embeddings that uh, better represents the relationships they have between the words in your vocabulary. Right, so by doing this, right, we have a better uh, starting point for our second phase, which is the supervised learning. So we just take the, uh, the, the word embeddings we get from here and we use them as the initial weights for our supervised learning phase. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, we, we, don't use, we don't need to use this unsupervised part anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, to, to, to visualize, to use the, the data set that's used just now. So for example, oh yeah, so I mentioned it, it's able to uh, give a better initialization of the, the, the model, so your, your initializing weights, and it, uh, yeah, would, uh, it gives a more meaningful representation of the words, your, your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so to better understand it in terms of the, the data set that was used by Rahul just now, uh, it's a bit like pre-processing it to something like this on the right, which is if you, if you perform like the normal supervised training on our, our, our label data sets, we can get a more accurate, uh, 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 a more accurate uh, results, right? So, uh, so this this is the generally the, the approach that we've taken. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, yeah. So this is generally so currently uh, pre uh, NLP models look like this. So generally with word to vec, we're just doing this, right? So we pre train it to have a, a a better word embedding to be used for our uh, encoder and prediction neural networks, right? But uh, it turns out there's uh, you can have, you have more effective approach, which is beyond just uh, using the word the, the unsupervised data set to generate to generate good uh, word embeddings. Uh, recent res recent research has shown that we can actually make a pre-trained uh, encoder neural network that we can then use for our supervised neural network as well, and this uh, generates better results. Uh, so an example of this, the first one is the uh, autoencoder. So uh, autoencoder is basically just training a, a seek to seek model to produce itself. So the target sequence it itself, right? So yeah, uh, and and after you train this model, you just take out the encoder part of it and you use it for your supervised learning, and you and, and you use it for uh, whatever task you want to. Eat task specific uh, neural network you want to use it for. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, um, essentially the, the idea behind this is to have a good uh, initialization for your supervised learning. Sorry, yeah. you mean, you mean uh, actually we set the target and see when we learn the code, right? And Sorry? Yeah. I mean, this pre-training means uh, the output is the same as the input. Yes. Then so the encoder decoder, right? So you, you the, the target is to uh, output itself in the decoding. Yeah. yeah. Why do we need this? We want to get some model. So it basically you want to encode within the encoder, you want to get like the 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 context of the of the, the, the your training set. The unlabeled the unlabeled training uh, data set. Yeah. Yeah. Why is supervised learning on the right side? 
Oh yeah, basically you take the encoder, so after you train this model, you just use the same the encoder you 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 got from this step and just uh, use this model here. And we are not we are actually not gonna change this uh, this part here, the encoder here. We're gonna use it to produce uh you, you're gonna apply it to the input to produce something that's a better initialization for the, the supervised learning. Or for this step. So a lot of thinking behind everything here is that you can take something that's like this sentence and it represents something in latent space or in latent variables uh, where if you knew the value of the hidden latent variables, it's very easy to predict a supervised learning task. So what the LSTM encoder is doing is that you're trying to uh, figure out the values of the hidden latent variables. Mm. So one way is that you can do encoder decoder. That's one way of doing it. That's um, that's a latent representation that's good for encoding and decoding. But another latent representation could also be good for supervised learning. And if you go back and forth, you'll find the right latent representation. So that's that's, that's the whole. Like, oh okay. So yeah. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. That, uh, okay. Even we can find them. Because so far we still had, um, I think most of them they have you know, right. Yeah. So, but but the idea is that if you look at the latent space, right? The idea is that okay, let's say I reduce, let's say the dimensionality of the original data is twenty thousand or like twenty thousand words, for example, um, and then the latent space is something like two hundred, right? So you're compressing from twenty thousand. Uh, to 200, and the idea is that at such an extreme compression, the latent uh, variables will have to start uh, essentially capturing the meaning of each word. Mm -hmm. And then if you know the meaning of each word, that seems like a very good representation to do supervised learning. Okay, that means we can get a better more representation, and then we can yeah. get to full yeah. 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 So the, the idea is to get the right latent. Yeah, and, and the idea behind using itself as a target is, is basically saying that after, before the decoder stage, the hidden layer should be able to capture well the itself, like the later meaning that it's in the own uh, data set. Yeah. Hmm. Very related to dimensionality reduction. It's a dimensionality reduction technique that's in the neural network domain, specialized for that. Do you guys want to go over it in more detail? Or did we talk about it? So, the purpose for this is to get a better work representation. Normally, we can just use work to get to. So, what you so word effect is a really good model. It's an unsupervised model. And uh, basically, the whole idea of pre-training in general is to, to, to help with optimization. Because the problem with neural networks is they're overly parameterized. right? So they have a very, very complex manifold for their loss. And you know, starting, if you choose an initialization value that's not good, and you do gradient descent or anything like that, you'll converge, but it'll be to some not so good local optimum, right? So the whole point of doing the pre-training is to set the network in a, a good initialization starting point, where then you have something task-specific you want to re-optimize it. So you can think of, okay, I have some loss manifold. I have some loss manifold, okay? Uh, and then if I optimize it for uh, you know, words of or any unsupervised learning, I might be able to find this part or this part. But then I, I'm going to impart a specific task-specific loss, right? And then uh, instead of, and it will be a modification of this manifold. Maybe it's something like this, okay? If I had started from you know one of the other uh, areas and I optimize, I would be able to get to this global optimum, right? 
So by, by doing the pre-training, I'm uh, predisposing the network to find pretty good starting points for the supervised task, right? Because if I don't initialize it, I initialize it randomly, I could start anywhere on this cost manifold, right? And then maybe it won't optimize it well, okay? So uh, you can think of as embeddings or, or word embeddings as, you know, sort of task agnostic pre-training, okay? So we say that, okay, because words are complex, uh, they're high dimensional in the sense that you might have 30,000 words, okay? And if I were to do one plot encoding, there's a problem there. So I want to fold them as uh, Mohit was saying, as other people said in, in, in uh, the earlier weeks, I want to fold them into a low dimensional space where there's a lot of semantic representation in each of the vectors, so it's more dense, right? So that's why we are doing word embeddings, right? Okay. But word embeddings is just one part, that's task agnostic, all right? Now, if I have an architecture, let's say an LSTM architecture, all right, and I want to also uh, try to use that, I can couple the LSTM architecture with the embeddings, which are pre-trained, but task agnostic, okay? So that's fine, many people do that. But what we found in neural networks over the, like, uh, since 2013 or so, is that pre-training even the task-specific network is very helpful. So this is what is uh, being done here through sparse autoencoding. Okay, so the autoencoding is that that part right there, right, where we have the um, the LSTM encoder and the LSTM de decoder. And the whole point is to generate back the target input because, of course, in in this uh, unsupervised setting, you don't have any labels learned, so the only thing you can do is tr well, to try to generate itself. So what good is that? It seems sort of silly to produce a network that's going to to produce itself back, right? I mean, what, what use is that? Can you guys say? I think the output from the decoder uh, would be able to represent the meaning of the whole. Yeah, well, so why is that helpful? I mean, data dimensionality. The reduction part, right? So that's the key part. Even though I have a, a, you know something here that might be high dimensional because it has all the vocabulary, when I represent it through the decoder or the LSTM decoder, I have going to have many fewer neurons, right? So if I want to produce back the pre-training pre data of it was good, I have many fewer nodes to represent that. If I gave a neuro, uh, uh, my pre-trained network. Uh, enough neurons, let's say 30,000 neurons, then I could just pass everything directly through, right? Then I don't need to encode anything, right? I just say it's an identity function. You know, you just take what you have as input, and you just chuck it back out, and I'm finished. But the whole point of the neural network approach is to squish it, right? You're, you're doing the encoder, and you're saying, okay, even though you have 30,000 possible values, I want you to represent all of that data in only five neurons. So just like the word to vec, right? The word to vec, you had a vocabulary of 30,000, you squished it down to 300 dimensions and you store that, right? Now we're doing the same thing here, but with the model that eventually will be used for the task itself, right? So we're saying, okay, why don't we just, you know, get the model used to seeing data of this sort, right? So that we can have an initialization value that's a good place to start from. Okay. So that's what we, we mean by the model pre-training, is that you can do this successively for each layer. You first pr uh, train the layer closest to the input. Okay, so you pre-train the first layer, uh, try to have it replicate that, uh, pre-train uh, the input on the output. After you fix the LSTM layer at layer one, if you're gonna stack another LST la LSTM layer on top, then you take the Decoded layer at the first level, keep that, throw away the decoder, and then you add another encoder layer on top of that. All right, so it's sequential. Let me let me try to show you some slides. Sorry. So let me see, which week was that? I think it's week ten.
okay? So uh, again, this uh, idea of, you know, word to vec or any of these models is to squish a network uh, of a larger set of parameters, right, inputs into a smaller set, right, so that your middle layer here is capturing all of that regularity and has to expand back out, right? So you're doing some semantic compression here. You can think of this exactly like dimensionality reduction, exactly like PCA, but just in the neural network style, right? Okay? And then what we do is we train the first hidden layer, okay? And we discard the output layer. So we throw away this layer here, okay? And then we are going to replace it with another layer, okay? So we've done the the pre-training of the first layer. So we've sort of uh, customized the neural network to that. And then you add another layer, another encoder on top of that. Okay? You keep on pre-training the network. Okay? Then you throw that away. Okay? And then you continue, right? So perhaps after the second layer, okay, I'm going to make it task-specific. I'm going to start training it in a supervised manner. I'm going to do the softmax and do the classification. Okay? But the whole point is that after we did the pre-training, both the green layer and the red layer are sort of already accustomed to seeing the data because we've been passing it, the unlabeled data, through, through the network, right? So in the sense of the two moons data set or other things that you saw before, the network has already gotten used to seeing that data. And now, at least the, the parameters are set in a way that's going to help it optimize for the task. So uh, that's what I wanted to show for that, right? So that's one of the very big tricks in uh, neural networks since 2013 is that without this type of pre-training, the neural network architectures are just too heavily parameterized. Too many possible ways that you could set it, okay, that they didn't converge well. When they converged, they converged to some local optima or, or even optima that's not very good. Uh, so you wouldn't get good task performance. So by pre-training, we were able to get better uh, task performance as a community because we can, um, you know, you can think of it a little bit like regularization as pushing the model towards a uh, hypothesis class that's good for the task. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we... we we always have a bias term so that we can get a hypothesis that's not on the origin. So it needs to be able to, to move around in the classification space. Yeah. So there's always a, a, a bias uh, element that, you know, usually when you, you do the computation, you pull it out in neural network style. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, so we treat, can use uh, the vector semi yeah, so pre-training you can think of as embeddings, you can think of pre-training even layers of a network, which is what uh, we were just talking about uh, before I interrupted. You know. So the idea is that uh, you, know, you can use pre-training in, in many different fashions. It, it's all got this regularization effect, okay? It's the, the point is that the, the, the networks are so expressive that you could set them any way you want. Right? And by random initialization doesn't help us. Okay? It just makes it harder to find what we're looking for. You have to do lots of uh, uh, retraining or, or, uh, and to try to get the model correct. Right? So if we, we pass the data through a number of times and try to come to, to uh, initial weights that are tuned to the model architecture itself. Right? So you you have the model architecture, you're passing the data through so that the initialization is, is going to be more, more close to what you wanted to do from there. Okay? I don't know whether that made a lot of sense, so you can tell me, okay, it doesn't make any sense at all. But the whole idea is that that pre-training helps to uh, regularize the model. You don't have to deal with the entire set of parameter space for initialization. You're trying to restrict it to a local um, set that's plausible because the data that you have in your data set is saying, well, that's that's representative of itself. Um, so, but for the actual um, class itself, where it's training, will it freeze the weights uh, for the, the, la the layer that was pre-trained, or it was just a, it's just a starting point? It's just a starting, it's point. A starting point. Okay. 
Yeah. So you, you, you pre-train the first layer, then you freeze the weights, then you pre-train the second layer, then you freeze the weights for the second layer, you pre-train the third layer, etc. Okay? Okay. And then all of that is done in an unsupervised manner because you don't have any label data at that point. All yeah. the purpose of that is just to help you set initialization points when you're actually doing the supervised learning. Okay. Right? Okay. Because a neural network needs to start from somewhere. You could do a random initialization, but in many cases, random initialization is not a good place to start from. You want to be slightly more informed about that. Right? Right. That happens in all sorts of algorithms. Even something like k-means or em has that problem. Right? So typically in EM or k-means, you run it multiple times. Okay? That's not so bad for k-means or EM because they're cheap. <laughs> you can uh, do them plenty of times. But not for neural networks. Right? Neural networks are expensive to train uh, at, at current architectures and current age. Right? Maybe in uh, five years that won't be such a big problem. Who knows? Okay? But uh, the point is that we, we, we are still thinking about good strategies to be smart with our initialization. Good questions. So, so before, like, before pre-training was uh, everywhere, I mean, I imagine that, you know, before pre-training and after pre-training, the same network is 3% better, 10% better? Quite, quite a bit better. Quite a bit better. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, without the pre-training and without uh, dropout and without ReLU, those were several of the very key algorithmic changes in neural networks that happened around 2010 to 2014 that popularized deep learning. Without those advances, we would still be stuck where we wouldn't have AlexNet, we wouldn't have ImageNet systems that are capable of, of, of you know, human level performance. And it's because, you know, basically the parameter space is too large. Neural networks can definitely do well, okay, because, well, even decision tree models can do very well. Okay, you can overfit very happily. The problem is we didn't know how to search that space well enough and to define methods for generalizing well enough. Right? We can overfit, no problem. We can always get the training data exact, no problem. Right? But the, yeah, how, how do we find models that uh, can uh, generalize well? And so uh, pre-training was one of those key parts to do the initialization correctly. ReLU was to deal with the gradient propagation in deep networks, right? And dropout too, right, is to, to help out to do the regularization and ensembling mechanism to help train many clones of the no network such that you can get good generalization. Add more layers and then you're done, right? Yeah. So I think it all comes back to, you know, you guys are, are uh, sort of lucky, sort of unlucky to be at this stage where algorithmic advances trump analysis work, okay? I mean, people like me from the days uh, where we had to really analyze our data well, we, we, we go, all this neural network stuff is just garbage because you don't need to understand your data. You just pass it through layers of layers of layers of convolution multiplications and then you're done. How does that work, right? You mean you don't need to analyze your data? And, and the fact of the matter is that you still need to analyze your data. It's just that part of it, need, uh, it can be given to the machine to understand, right? So uh, again, like I said a couple times, there are lots of technologies and, and understandings from traditional machine learning, like AdaNet we talked about before, adaptive methods, right? which harken back to traditional machine learning. You know, it's just reapplied because people know it and then they can reapply it in the neural network guides. Okay, so it doesn't hurt to study traditional machine learning. It's harder in many cases. The math is a lot worse. Okay, but um, it, it will pay off, I'm sure. And, and you should analyze your data because that regularity, you can always find some way of introducing that as a constraint, as a preference, as a loss function, okay, into your network in a way that uh, smartly embodies or, or regularizes the problem, right? When you do that, you are you are doing some work. You 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 say, you know, I know neural networks could do it for me, but let's make the search easier. Let's make it optimal, and, and let's uh, introduce it in a way 
that I'm taking the advantage of neural networks in, the, in its ability to optimize, but I'm going to introduce my understanding of the problem, uh, put it in, in uh, maybe a probabilistic uh, framework so that uh, the network can optimize for me. Okay, yeah. Oh, thank you, Prof. Uh, yeah, for the, uh, so yeah, this is just showing that uh, you get better results from free training compared to the previous best result, just training on supervised data. Okay, so uh, this, uh, the two other techniques, uh, the other, uh, one other recent technique is uh, COVE, which is uh, context vectors. Uh, I, I don't really quite understand this, but basically it's, it's almost like, okay, uh, it's similar in that you make encoder out of, uh, you, you train uh, encoder decoder, but this time you're using uh, machine translation training. Yeah, and uh, likewise you use the same encoder from here to initialize the supervised training. Yeah. Again, it's so so that's a supervised task used for yeah. training. Yeah. But then it's, it's probably the reason why it works is that again all you're trying to do is you're trying to get um, latent representation. Yeah, a better initialized. Yeah. Right. Mm. So a latent representation that goes from one language to another should be more useful than the one that goes from itself to itself. Right? Yeah. But uh, I think uh, on top of that, uh, Cove also. Uh, it also concatenates the context vectors that you get from the encoder to, to the glove representations of the words for your training. Uh, this one, uh, this part I don't quite understand, but uh, yeah, I think that it, you train it with this. Yeah, you basically concatenate the glove vectors and the context vectors together for the supervised part. Mm. It's like, okay, so if yeah. you have twice the amount of it, uh, they're just adding them. Yeah. I mean, like, if you mm. have twice as amount of different variables, I'm sure you can represent things better than you have once. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is for context factors. Uh, and there's one more technique called ELMO, which is, uh, oh, yeah, so this is just showing that you get better results uh, and improvement from this technique with GLUV and uh, context factors. Uh, and there's another one called uh, ELMO. This one's quite interesting because uh, it doesn't just take the output layer. Well, I'll show this first. Okay, so uh, first you you train a bi a bidirectional LM, and you you sort of concatenate the the hidden states together for each word to get this, and then you perform uh, you perform this uh, operation on the multiple layers. So you it's it's not just taking the output layer, but it's also taking all the layers inside the uh, inside the bidirectional LM and you use it to make the ELMO vector, this vector that you use to train on the supervised data. Yeah. Uh, this, it's, it's similar to code, but code only takes uh, the last layer, for example. This one takes all the layers in the bidirectional uh, LSTM. Yeah. And you use it, and you just uh, co concatenate it to your inputs, uh, similar to code, and uh, this also gets bet uh, better results. And for some tasks, also according to the paper, you just uh, add this on to the hidden state as well, the elbow vector, and you get a, yeah, and you also get better results for that. Well, I mean, I question if you make your hidden vector mm. so big, if I, if I instantiate 20 different autoencoders and I train them to convergence, and I, you know, use all those like, representations concatenated together, it's yeah. a bit better than that, right? Yeah. So it, it's like, it's very, very tricky to mm. justify this, right? Yeah. Like, because the, the honest thing that they're saying is, well, if I gave it a little bit more computation resources, I'd be even better. And that's like saying, so you know, I mean, have yeah. infinite computation resources, I'm sure we can do it. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah. But uh, from what I understand, this is almost like the previous method, the context vectors, but uh, it captures more, uh, more layers in the hidden layer, well, in, in the, the hidden state. Yeah. In some sense, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, so as you reduce the dimension, right, you're inherently losing some information. And then now they're saying is that if we could keep all those representations, keep all the residual yeah, so 
all those are, yeah, so yeah, as you can see, it just has better results than the other techniques. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so basically the idea behind free training is like what uh, Prof mentioned, is just to take the data and get a, a later representation that better, that, re that reduces the dimension and also uh, retains the meaning in your words and use that for your supervised learning and has yielded, it has yielded really good results. Yeah. So now uh, we talk, moving on to self-training. I think Glo uh, Go, uh, sorry, Go is just one stop on the way to more proof of word vectors. So Alan AI has introduced Elmo as a result, which was discussed in this slide, and just later, earlier last month, this month, was uh, Google's release of another set of uh, embeddings called BERT. So uh, yeah, see that on, on that. So there, it's still steadily evolving uh, what, what people are doing in, in the embedding field. Uh, yes, so, <coughs> so uh, just a quick introduce on cell training before Eric do the heavy lifting. So we, we come back to the two moon data set the idea of self-training is that <coughs> we train it with whatever label data we have, and then we <coughs> use a model that we just train uh, to try to label more some more data, like whatever we are most confident with that label it, and then with more data we train again, and the the circle that just continue until maybe we are happy with the result. <coughs> For example, here we have one, two, three, red, and one, two, three, blue. So with this six data, we can have a thread line like this. <coughs> and then we find some, some data that we are more confident about. Purple knee is a one over here, and okay. So we say that of uh, net just labels them by the the model we just have and train again. Now we have a more and look more sophisticated model, and with this we label again, train again until we're happy. Yeah, this is just some some result. I think not so good anyway. So this is a, the description of the algorithm. You train, you label, and then you train again. Of course, it is just not how we describe, but how we put it into a formula so that the computer can do it for us. A, a different story. Yeah. So this is one of the more simple one, I suppose. So we have the, the label data x, y, and the unlabeled data x. Then with this, we uh, we we choose one hot to like I thought we did. We choose the most extreme one. Is this? Yeah. Uh, why we? you the one hot because we want the extreme one and yeah without without the one hot and the over here then this one and this one will look the same and then the cross entropy will give us nothing yep. uh, and another way to improve is you use this consistency. Sorry? What's the target? Yeah, uh, what I understand is that it's just similar to what we do over here. Yeah. 
Sure. So online self-training, you have a partially trained model, um, and then you feed in. You set up. You take a mini batch, right? And um, that mini batch has labeled and unlabeled data. But then you label the unlabeled data. You just run through the model. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. Which part? The whole. The whole right side of it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this one? So, so the one part are lags, it's just you're creating a one part vector uh, from the probabilities because when you, when this model, this model is trained with like cross entropy and it's a classification model of one of the classes. So when you run it through, it will essentially give you uh, an approximate From the unlabeled data, we use our model, then from each of the data, we can get some probability, right? Yes. We select some of them, which we are confident they are the, like, the, we are sure or they have higher probability to be the positive case or negative case, then we put them to the yeah. Yeah. So data set. Yeah, for two, two class, yeah. Uh, but, but also for yeah, for two classes, essentially, you would just take an unlabeled data and you'll run it through. And then whichever is most likely to be used against the data set. Yeah, I'm really interested in this because uh, right now I'm trying to build this in my daily world. Right? And we have uh, some unlabeled data. We already have some model with labels that we try to use the unlabeled data. OK, so the self training and active learning are two separate parts on the same spectrum, they're related, so I think we should know. We should also know um, co-training, another method that we can get. So self-training, as we already talked about, is uh, you take uh, the learner and uh, you ask it to uh, label unlabeled data, right? And then once the labeled data, the unlabeled data that your, lab uh, your learner labeled, you take the most confident Add it into the data set. So let's pretend, let's say we have some instance, and uh, let's say it's got um, three values y, 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 right? Okay, and let's say uh, the predicted uh, distribution looks like this. Okay, right? So then I am pretty confident it's y1, right? And so what uh, Mocket was trying to explain, I think, is that uh, we just change it to this. So we're just saying, um, well, if it's confidence y1, let's just pretend it's y1. And then all of this region here that's wrong is helping us build the gradient for us to tell the learner, well, make your function more like this square function than this distribution. So I have a gradient to learn on here, right? I can try to maximize my uh, parameters so that the results are Right. So without that, then you don't have a gradient to learn on, right? Your, your, your predicted distribution looks like this curve, and since you don't have a way of representing how to differ from that, you won't learn anything, right? So by one hotting it, you're basically saying, all this stuff here that you thought was possible is junk. Actually, this is the right way. Right? Okay, so that is the way that this system is saying Go learn from your mistake and just pretending that this is the right answer. Okay? So another term you guys should know is active learning. Do you know what that means? Right? It's the opposite of what we're doing from self-training. Self-training is you're most sure as a learner you got this problem right. So for example, I teach you machine learning. Uh, you're looking at a mock exam and saying, I know these questions already. Okay? So I, I, I'm pretty confident I got this right, so I'm just going to call it right. Yeah, active learning is the opposite. I look at this question and I have no idea how to solve it. Okay, what do you do then? You go ask somebody to help you, right? So with active learning, you're, you're basically asking 
your supervisor, your teacher, or your human, okay? Go label these instances for me because I have no idea what to do with it, okay? So active learning is a, a, a strategy to go figure out what instances to label, okay? So you have unsupervised data. Some of it's easy, self-learning, self-training. Some of it's hard, I have no clue. Do active learning, okay? Ask the person to go annotate that data, okay? Because it gives you the most amount of bang for the buck, right? You reduce your entropy the most possible because those are the ones that your classifier is most unsure of. So it makes most sense to go after those problems, right? Okay. So that's active learning. What about co-training? Have you guys heard of that? Co-training is when you have two separate systems learn from different parts of the data. Okay, it's a little bit like feature projection that you see in random forest. Okay, so the idea is that you have some input space, x1, x2, for example. Okay, uh, let's say these are sets of data. So for example, let's say this is image data, pixel data. Okay, and let's say this is natural language data, caption data. Okay, and I'm going to learn, let's say, a representation of what that image is about. I could learn it from the caption, right? I could say, based on the caption, uh, it says Obama, and then that's probably Obama, right? But based on the uh, possibility from the image data that there are lots of uh, brown pixels, and maybe that's more than be a brown human, maybe that's Obama, so I can learn about that, okay? So co-training is another method in which we are going to actually build two classifiers, okay? I build a classifier based on the feature projection from X1. Just use X1, all right? I build a whatever model I want, neural network model, whatever, okay, decision for us, okay? And then I build another model here. And guess what? I have two independent learners here. If I have X1 and X2 represent fairly different types of input, they have to be fairly different, okay? If they're the same type of input, of course, well, it's almost equivalent to normal type of learning, all right? So I, I'll give you a use case that I did in my research, all right? So let's say I want to do a web page classification, okay? And I want to decide what type of web page this is. I could determine that based on the words on the page, okay? I could also, not so feasibly, but, you know, humor me for a second, try to decide the, the, um, the class of the page based on the layout of the page, okay? Meaning very far away, let's say 10 feet away, I don't see any content, but I know how the screen is laid out. Okay, so maybe I know this is more like an informational page, or maybe it's more like a, a game or, or something like that. So just using layout information, ignoring the content, just using the layout, I can get some signals. Okay? So I train x1, a learner from the text. I train x2, learner from some other piece of data. Okay? And these are going to act as teachers and students to each other. Right? I can do self-learning, but do it in this coordinated sense. I'm going to take the little things that this classifier thinks are the most likely correct cases in the unlabeled data. Okay, so I give both learners an uh, unlabeled data. Okay, I say, you go classify all the unlabeled data, and you just tell me on a, a scale of 1 to 100 how likely you think your classification is right. Okay, the ones that you think are right could do self-training on, but you could also pass it to the other learner, right? Give it to X2, learner H2, okay? H2 says, well, you know, maybe I don't have a really good feeling about that, but you, as a fellow learner, felt very strongly that was class Y, okay? So I'm going to use that as the label, okay? So I pass the high confidence ones from X1, I use them as training data for X2, I take X2's most confident ones and use them as training data for X1, okay? So this is sort of like EM type of thing, right? You, you have alternating steps, okay? So this is the co-training I do, okay? So that works in certain circumstances. So the X1, X2 here means different features, right? Uh, different types of features that might be good for different things. This is very similar to feature projection that you might have learned in random forest. Random forests also do this. So when you say a random decision tree forest, the decision tree forests are based on this idea of feature projection. 
meaning that I have a, a whole input uh, set, x1 through xn, but when I do random uh, projection in decision trees, I don't want to use the entire data set for, for it. Why? Because when you do decision trees, normally the root of the decision tree will not change even if you change the types of inputs that you get. Okay? Usually the most salient chi-squared meaningful or entropy uh, information gain node will still be preserved even in random uh, selection of data. Okay, so we do feature projection in random course to, to, to ensure that we have enough variance. So in your example, uh, x1 maybe uh, web page content, x2 yeah. maybe the layout of it. Yeah. Or in the other example, what, uh, this is image data, this is caption data. Okay, also fine. So that's another method you could use. Okay, well, you can split your... Uh, your data into so, so the active learning uh, use it to ask other to help label the data, right? Yeah, it's basically a smart way of getting good use of your annotations, right? Instead of saying you just annotate some data, what I want to do is annotate data in a way that's maximally helpful for the model that I'm training. Right, but in the real case, if Right now I have a huge number of unlabeled data and then because the biggest concern is I don't have a lot of uh, resource to label this data. Now how can I maybe ask other experts to label this? Well, active learning can only work if you have the capability of annotating the data. It can't work if you uh, need to get uh, some other mechanism to annotate it. Okay, the best that you can do there is something like co-training. Right, co-training is basically saying somebody else, another learner, has learned on this data, supervised what you learn, and is passing you the, the things that it's most confidently about to train it up. Okay. So uh, these are uh, again really really old things that you might have learned in traditional machine learning class. You won't learn them in the Neural network class because we haven't hit the threshold where we need to use techniques like this yet. So uh, you know, enjoy, and hopefully it'll come use again. Okay. Let's thank our presenters so far. I'm sorry, we didn't thank our. Yeah. Okay. So let me just go on from here. His last slide. Right, so basically we have the one hot thing, which is, oh, sorry, I haven't introduced myself, I'm Eric. Right, I'm a first year PhD student doing machine learning. Actually, this is not kind of my area of knowledge, I wouldn't say expertise. Uh, it's more um, reinforcement learning, but I don't know why I've been doing for last year. So, so for one hot uh, encoding, right, you get this kind of um, distribution. So you're trying to skew the model, right? But uh, sometimes you get like worse performance from that because like if this is actually wrong, then you become more wrong, right? So the idea is to you know go back and learn the distribution, but once you put it back, it's kind of like you're learning from the same thing, and it doesn't kind of make sense, right? So that's where this new idea uh, came about. Okay, so basically you have uh, some data, and you're trying to extend the data, and the idea here is hallucination, right? Which means that you see a cat, uh, you kind of like know it's a cat, but you imagine how another cat might look like, you know, by differing it by a little bit. So this eta here, it's just a vector, right? And this magnitude is just a magnitude. So you are trying to perturb the vector x by this... Uh, by this random uh, vector here. So if you can see this example here. So you are taking a direction eta on this uh, circle here. So you are actually perturbing your, your, your data by, by, that, by that range. And you can take epsilon to be any kind of small perturbation that you want to make. Okay, so is this clear? 
Yeah. Do you okay. guys know another algorithm that does this type of consideration of machine learning? SVM. SVM, yeah. So which, which part of SVM are we talking about? Um, much like the um, quantum computing stuff. Right. So uh, are you, you guys all familiar with that analogy? Right. This is akin to soft SVM, right? Or, or, or just, just SVM in general, where we're trying to maximize the de decision boundaries. Uh, a quick thing I want to mention is that this assumption, uh, when, when we're just converting like a probability into like one half, right? You're um, you're you're assuming that there's information that isn't there, right? But here you're actually not assuming. I think that this is a much um, this is a much softer assumption here in a mathematical yes. sense than this. Correct. Because this is saying something about the smoothness of the manifold versus this is coming up with yeah. random information. Yes, right? yes, correct. Yeah. So this is a softer assumption mathematically correct. than that. Yes, yes, yeah. OK, so this is just an example. So I mean, the black dots are the unlabeled data, and the red and blue are the labeled. So what you what you kind of the intuition right is uh, you're drawing circles around the data. So like for the blue and the red, so obviously the whole circle will be blue and red, and you kind of propagate that uh, color across the overlaps to the whole data set. That's the kind of intuition, right? So the decision boundary will kind of become like that because the overlapping circles will actually chain up. That's how you utilize your labeled data to label your unlabeled data. So it's kind of like this data is close to that data. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. The question, do we need to normalize our data before we this on it? That's a great question. I think I think we'll come to that later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, obviously, this method actually came from um, computer vision. I actually have wanted to create some slides, but I ran out of time. So uh, basically, the idea is you have an image and you perturb it by some noise. Later, we'll get to see some examples of that. And this is actually the CIFA 10 data set. So you can take a look at the papers if you want. Um, yeah. So obviously, this this method works, right? Not why we'll be talking about it. Okay. So now the question is how do you apply this technique in NLP? Okay. Um, it's there are three ideas that, that uh, in this slide that have presented, but I'm sure you can find uh, many others. One idea is just add noise. This is quite straightforward. I think when once you read this, you should be able to get the kind of idea and word drop out and cross view consistency okay okay so the first idea is um, add noise to the word embeddings right they call it virtual adversarial training yeah so uh, that, that's kind of that's kind of like a many words but it doesn't really mean a lot of things to me I, I read the paper to, to see what virtual means it actually doesn't mean much so I'm not gonna talk about that Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like reading. Why is it like virtual? I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So basically, they are just trying to add noise to the embedding, right? And just now, uh, Prof Khan mentioned, um, can you actually do this technique without, you know, normalizing your data? So it says here you can't, but what's the intuition behind it, right? What's the intuition behind uh, needing to kind of constrain or to normalize the, the vector before you apply the noise? Okay, I'll give you some examples, right? Then maybe you understand. Right, one, two, three. So let's say example you have a vector one, two, three versus 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right? 
So if you are adding the noise here, so let's say the noise is like some noise, 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0.002, right? So when you have this kind of case, uh, you will want to, uh, if, if you apply the same kind of noise to both of them, one of them will be more effective than the other, right? Because um, if, if you apply this noise to this, to this vector, it's kind of like the, the weights will be too um, large to actually consider the noise. So that, that's, that's kind of why you actually need to um, have like this zero mean and unit variance thing to constrain so that the model doesn't ignore the noise. Okay? Yeah. So I haven't talked about one thing. One of the things that I haven't talked about is I mentioned that here I am actually looking at this uh, eta, right? But there are many, many etas here. The question is which one to choose? So that's why it comes to this. Okay. Uh, let me explain, right? So we look at this example first. So this, this comes from image. This, this whole technique comes from image. So the initial idea behind um, this concept was because, let's say example, you have like a neural network, CNN, whatever, right? You are actually reading in this image and predicting that it's a giant panda. Okay, so apparently what you can do is that you add some random noise here, Gaussian noise, or some noise that you constructed carefully, right? And apparently after doing that, the image still looks like a panda, but to the neural network, it is not a panda, right? And so this is essentially the problem. So that's why they have this, like, they come out with this, this whole technique. Uh, more stuff here, so... I won't talk more, it's the kind of same kind of stuff. Security implica uh, implications, right? I mean, if you're using this in your driverless cars, you, you won't want like a sticker to be placed underneath stop to, 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 to interpret it otherwise, right? You'll not be very safe. Okay, so what do I mean by, you know, choosing a eta, right? So, so let's say example, this is your point, and then this is your epsilon. Okay, so let's say for your model, um, if you actually run your model on this space here, you'll get like this kind of prediction. And then this side, you will actually get like a different prediction. So what I mean by choosing, you're actually choosing a, a value to use on this um, on this uh, circle, okay, because you are actually choosing a point to optimize your model, right? So if you take a look at this, you don't, you don't sample. yeah, yeah, you sample from that. You sample from the circle. So okay. basically, you are choosing a sample, oh, right? Okay, okay. So you, I mean, you can you can just do a random sample and you just like pick anyone, right? So you are actually essentially choosing an eta, right? By by the random choice. It's actually just choosing an eta. So, so is, is the so the eta is this is a L two law, as in like so they're not saying that add a random yeah form. well so I mean are they that, or is this okay so for for my my case I'm using like obviously L two right okay. so but I I think the technique can be applied to L n whatever your n you want it to be, right? I'm just saying if you just, at the time of training, right, this is just a human activity, right? You just randomly toss or randomly come up with an epsilon. Yes. Right? But it doesn't do the exact the same thing. Or right. So epsilon is kind of like the size of the circle. Okay. Right? Sure. So if you choose a larger epsilon, you get something that's further away from the data. So, so but you still need the direction, right? Okay, so, so this in this technique, you're not actually, you're, you're picking, um, the epsilon is fixed, but the direction is not fixed. Yes. Okay, okay so yeah. this is different. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, when you start the training, you already predefine the epsilon. 
So that's kind of like the acceptable perturbation that you, you accept, right? And obviously you want to use that randomly across all your samples. If not, all your data will be skewed, right? So that's why we are choosing eta. Okay, so that's clear. Okay, so let me go on with the adversary. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to cleverly pick a point, right? Because if you look at this, if this is some x like 1, and if, you, if the network or the model uh, try to randomly pick a point, it might say pick this, and then it trains based on this. What happens is that the loss will not be that high, right? Because you are actually classifying already correct, right? Maybe there isn't any loss at all, right? Versus even if you pick this, it might not be as high too. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to pick a point in the circle that maximizes the loss. Okay, so let's say on this circle, basically what, what you have here is basically this point, right? It's the furthest away uh, uh, from, from the model in that sense. Okay, so instead of picking a random direction, you pick a specific direction. And essentially, if you do that, just a trivia, right? So if you actually have access to an image model or image neural network, you actually can, can select like specific noise to actually trick the neural network by looking at this. The reverse law basically. We are looking at for at, I mean today we are looking it forward, but if you look it backwards, you can actually come off the image. Okay, so obviously, yeah, I mean the results, okay. Okay, so just now I talked about this this simple idea, so obviously that is like kind of like a, a direct application into NLP. So this is actually also quite simple. Basically, you are just, instead of looking at this like perturbation, you are looking at the perturbation in another space, right? So basically, you are just dropping words, which is directly in, in how the input is. And yeah, so it's a very simple idea. So, yeah. So, so the virtual adversarial training works better than random examples? Uh, yes. It works better. Yeah. So actually they compare this one versus the virtual adversary training. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it works. It, it works better, yeah, but it, it doesn't work it much better. Yeah. Better. Correct. Yeah, but I mean this one you, you, it kind of like make a little bit of I mean it makes sense because like you're actually considering the the domain, right? So basically instead of like um having random like perturbations in some kind of space, word, word embedding space that might not, might have some other issues, you're actually looking at some perturbation in the actual word space. So that kinds of like should perform better kind of, kind of idea. Yeah. I think the two are quite orthogonal techniques. You could probably possibly use both of them together. Yeah. Right, so the, the one that Eric is introducing on the board, the Epsilon uh, uh, virtual area of training is looking at it in the mathematical framework, right? Just saying that, okay, I have an epsilon ball that I want to join by uh, my training example, and I'm going to do it in a way to optimize the loss, right? So it's thinking about the loss function. The loss function is not inherently something specific to the domain, so it is perfectly also fine to do it within the domain and think about your data directly. Right? Yeah. But uh, I mean, I looked at the results, they are not much better, they're just better, you know. So, okay, so the last idea is this uh, cross-view consistency, right? I, I mean, this, this will take a while to explain because it's, it's more complicated than the rest. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe I will start by drawing something because I, I feel that, I mean, it's a bit Okay, so the main idea here, you're actually duplicating uh, this thing called the uh, prediction module. Okay, 
So the high level idea is that they have a buy LSTM. Okay, so you can see it later, I think. Yeah, so buy LSTM. Okay, so I think I'm not sure if we talked about buy LSTM before. Did we? Most of you guys know. Right. Okay. So buy LSTM, then you have this uh, prediction layer where you have a primary, you have a aux one. Aux 2, Aux 3, and Aux 4. In their paper, they use four of these auxiliary layers. Okay, so um, what happens is that this is the same LSTM, okay, and you will come up with five different predictions. Okay, so this is the architecture, okay. So what happens is that, what they want to do is that they want to create this um, word dropout four different times. Okay, basically they want to drop out in a certain way for four different so-called views. Okay, one way to think of it is simply this, right? So you see this example here below, right? It's the same sentence but missing different parts. So it's kind of like you're forcing the model to learn different things from different views, but from the same data set. Okay? All good? Any questions? Okay, so essentially if you look at this and if you do it sequentially, you will actually need like I mean, four different runs, right? And you'll be essentially very slow because you're actually looking at four different uh, views of the same data and you kind of randomly drop out different things for different views and you need to run four times as slow, okay? So essentially, yes. And if you run in parallel? Yeah, 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 so we'll come to that. So of course you run in parallel, you can run the, the same naive way and you run parallel and it definitely works, right? But they have, they have um, composed their architecture in a certain way to make, uh, to, to not do this parallel thing. Okay, which is what I'm going to talk about. So what I've drawn here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll not use this. Okay. So essentially what happens is that they have this by LSTM and they have this prediction layer. And these prediction layer are using the same output from the LSTM in different ways. And different uh, auxiliary and primaries will see different parts of this output. Okay, but essentially it's the same network for all of them. Okay, so far clear? So same network, different prediction layers. Okay, so how they wire it up is as follows. Uh, this slide uh, does not do a very good job, I feel, explaining it. So if you want, you can look at the paper. I think they updated the diagram, so it doesn't look like that anymore. Okay, let me try to explain that. So essentially, um, they have this by LSTM. So they have the forward and they have the backward. Okay, and this is at where it's currently at. This is the past. This is the future. Okay, in any way you wanna. Okay, this is the future. Okay, let's say. Okay, so basically, what you have is that you have like one of the prediction modules. So just now I mentioned prediction uh, layer, right? So basically, you have five layers. One is the main auxiliary one, auxiliary two, auxiliary three, auxiliary four. Okay. So these four auxiliary layers, they have actually created names for them. So basically, you have the main layer, which is just the prediction, okay? And you have the forward module, and you have the backward module, and you have the future module, and you have the past module. So basically, this... Um, 
four, uh, five layers are wired up slightly differently to look at the different, uh, slightly different views of the data, right? And, and this is specific to their problem, right? So if you want to create like different layers to do different things, that's fine. But the basic idea is this. You are actually creating multiple views of the data and you're having that different prediction modules of that different views to learn from them. So essentially, you kind of like, I mean, to me, when I read this, the, the high level idea or the most intuitive idea that I can think of is um, cross-fold validation, you know. You have one set of data, you randomly perturb it in different cases and you kind of like train five models, six models, ten models, and then you pick the best, right? So this is kind of what they are doing. Not exactly, but that's kind of the idea that jumps at me. My question is that um, is this whole setup to make training efficient? Is that their whole goal? Is that if you do it this way, then you don't need like K passes to it? Okay. So I think right, we can go back to why adversary. No, no, no. But yeah. I understand why this would work. My question is that this whole yeah, yeah. complicated hookup. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, just, just bear with me for a while, right? So this adversary kind of, um, uh, like, why adversary training, at least from what I understand, why it came about is because of robustness, right? You want, you want like, the model to perform robust, robustly, right? But for their case, I think um, why they are trying to do this, I think they're just trying to squeeze extra performance. That's at least from my point of view. I, I'm not exactly sure, right? But uh, yeah. I guess they're trying to build almost a discrete denoising autoencoder where the, the noise is added in discrete uh, amounts and not con like continuous amounts. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this method is data efficient. I mean, if you want to train like. Um, on a, a different kind of views, then you take more kind of time. But, but I mean, they, they are essentially trying to black out chunks yeah. of data. Yeah. So it's an, almost a discrete noise, not a continuous noise. Yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so essentially, what, what they are trying to do is in their this prediction kind of uh, part. They are just applying uh, here, right? Different attention and softmax weights. So basically, in their prediction layers, the, their weights are different for different uh, so-called views, right? But the rest of the network is essentially the same. So you can see this diagram. This diagram is a bit confusing because like the forward and things is not like to my point of view, it's not uh, very clear. So you have like two layers explained here, forward and future, but they have uh, two more. Okay, so essentially this is like talking about a layer, right? And the layer would be just applying a different attention distribution and different softmax weights to, to learn from them. Okay? So essentially we are just, just trying to do the same thing, right? As what? We talked about previously. We are just trying to learn from ourselves, right? In this case, this guy is just trying to uh, learn from the view, right? So basically, you, you get like a case where uh, you, you rotate across these views and you get a sum over the views, and that's essentially it. Okay? Right. I mean, I, I mean, the, the semi-supervised part, I would think it's in that hallucination of data. I don't know. I think. So semi-supervised always means you have some unsupervised data and you need that to expect the performance in your supervisor. So this is not like that, right? This is, you have uh, supervised data, but you're, you're trying to make that data more effective, right? You're not using unsupervised data. Yeah. Right. 
means is you're making you're taking the supervised data and making it more effective by generating um, noisy versions of the supervised data, right? So in yeah. this case, uh, all the, the word dropout and then this cross view consistency is that you just leave out some parts of the data, um, perturb the data in some ways, so that you, you still have the correct label. But uh, in this one, at least you have this gradient that's uh, given by the, the, the primary view. Yeah. So, okay, that means uh, to fix the vendor, then it's a stronger model that we can use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, I think, I mean, when we, when I talk about adversarial kind of techniques, you can think of it as the model is more robust. It's the same kind of thing as uh, cost validation that you get a more robust performance because you kind of like try several times. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea that, that I have at least. I'm not sure I'm 100% yeah. right. Sir, I'd say it's a little bit different. This is not adversarial in any sense, right? You, you're just saying, I blank out parts of the thing and then you have to do it. Right? Adversarial means I purposely try to make your system fail so that I can manufacture a hard case for your class to yeah. learn from. So it's a, it's a little bit uh, more, well, adversarial. <laughs> a little bit more yeah. uh, tuned towards making uh, uh, important mistakes so that your, your learner can yeah. So this is just making you more use of your data uh, in an effective manner. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see an adversarial cross view consistency model next year. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, adversarial yeah. is fine. I mean, it's yeah. so, just saying that instead yeah. of, you know, just randomly picking words to disappear, why don't we pick the word that's going to cause the most loss for you? Yeah. Right? And then use that as a way of changing it. So, I mean, maybe you don't need the adversarial part because, you know, with Sox, SoftMax being such a uh, simple computation, you can afford to run, you know, n number of SoftMax on top of the, the network. Yeah. I, I, think, I think exactly right. So basically just now when I'm talking about the perturbation in like the word embedding space, right? So essentially you can just pick random, right? In this case, it's just random word drops. So yeah. Um, if you can choose like the adversarial kind of way, then it will be exactly the same case as here. You pick this to to train the loss, yeah. Which I mean, that's that's how it, how it works. Okay, so yeah, advantages like I mean, the the good thing is that you don't have to run in parallel, and you get to basically squeeze more stuff out of your data, right? So yeah, I mean, that's it. Yeah, of course, good results. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I think semi-supervised is, is quite interesting, right? Because uh, it actually kind of uh, try to get the best of both worlds, right? Because there's a lot of data out there that is uh, very expensive to label if you actually use a person to label, right? Especially if you're doing your research, you have to pay some guy to sit down there or you yourself sit down there and, 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 and label the data. So, so some, some of these techniques are useful for that. So the other part is the adversarial kind of method that I talked about. It's, it's a way to just make it more robust uh, generally and, and, and to scale, right? And okay, that's it for me. Is there another presenter after that, or is that the last slide? Yeah, last. That's the last slide. Okay, so we've come to the end of our course. Congratulations. Give yourselves a round of applause. So we are done. Thank you for participating in this course. I, I've seen many of you over the last couple of weeks, and I, I'm pleased to have you all here. Um, so hopefully you'll join us again next semester um, in one way or another, and uh, look forward to that. So. Thank you very much. That's all. So if you want to stay with us for OBAR trip, I think there were only a couple people who wanted to do that. It's perfectly fine um, uh, to go. If, if we decide not to go, that's also fine too. So uh, those of you who still want to hang out, uh, you just stay around. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good luck with your finals and exams or your projects or wherever you're going on. Keep in touch with us.